You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. Blair, today we are going to talk about why advertising agencies don't advertise. That's ridiculous. Of course, advertising agencies advertise. <laughs> I see their ads everywhere. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, the only ones I've seen actually are the ones, uh, the large full page ones where they're apologizing for something. But I, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen. So, so you you told me one time, maybe after a scotch, I can't remember. You you told me that uh, this was one of the first pieces you wrote about. Are you still proud of it? Yeah, it was the first piece of thought leadership I ever wrote, and it was back in the late 90s. I was doing business development for a firm, a full-service marketing firm that had an advertising division, a design division, a real estate marketing division, and an a- Asian language marketing division. And, Asian uh, marketing – wait, they're selling Asian languages? They're Asian marketing <laughs> languages? <laughs> yeah. So if you've ever spoken South <laughs> Korean – that firm developed and sold that language. So yeah. I'm picturing a typewriter, clack, 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 or were you, well, it probably was actually. You probably Yeah, it was, it was the late 90s and it was, um, so I ra- took over running a small office, uh, uh, the, the second office, this firm was based in one market, I took over the office in the, se- in the, in the second market and when I moved in, all the clients moved out because the, my predecessor, they were all based on a personal relationship with him and they, they weren't the best clients so I think everybody was happy to see them move on and I thought, okay, my job is to build this office. I've got to, I've got to start selling something. How am I going to do this? And I thought, you know, I'm a writer at heart. I thought, well, I'm just going to put my feet up on the desk and write for a little while. And I said that to my boss, the president of the firm and who's back at head (laughs) office. And he said, yeah, whatever you want. So, uh, um, I, uh, I conceived of this, an article titled why advertising agencies don't advertise because our firm shortly after I joined it, we found ourselves in an interesting position We a family fight. It was kind of a family business. There are heads of all these different divisions and me running this other office. And we, we were, I think we won or we were gifted, um, a sizable print ad in the national, um, marketing publication. And so maybe we'd sponsor, I don't remember what it was, but we, we had this, uh, we had this print ad. So the boss said to basically all the division heads and, and me running the remote office, um, okay, you guys figure out what, what the ad looks like. And I forget who wrote the brief for it, but the concepts that kept coming up, um, I was horrified at them. First of all, like there was nothing, what about concept A? And all of the concepts were trying to prove in some way or another that we were more creative. And that, I guess that's noble enough, but I think when, when ad agencies do advertise, that's, um, that's what they try to do and it's a hard one to win. And I saw like ad concepts where um, the, the creative team was we, we're in, we're proposing to in an ad brag about the fact that we worked so hard and so late that our our spouses were divorcing us and our kids were estranged from us. Oh man, that sounds like such an ad agency idea. I you know, I was the only one in the firm who didn't find like broken families funny. Um yeah, I was newly married, had at least one small, had two small children. And I just I, I couldn't believe that we were this is what we were proposing. And so there was a <laughs> there was a lack of strategy and there was a lack of strategy because there was a lack of strategy in the firm. The firm was not well positioned. Right. It had had years of success based on the uh, based on a combination of things. One of them being um, the uh, the the uh, strength of one of the individuals at the head, head of the firm. Very good rainmaker type business development right. person. And the other one was a very good creative creative director. So those two in combination allowed the firm for many years to kind of. Um, not violate the rules of success, but we see this all the time. I, I think the su- business development success in a creative firm comes down to positioning product process and personnel. And so it wasn't, it wasn't positioned well. It didn't have pr- – product to me is the collection of skills, capabilities, and processes – that support a firm's positioning. So it's it's the there there. It's proof that you're able to do this, that you're able to support whatever claim yeah. you're making in the marketplace. 
Uh, process is the very broad subject of how a firm goes about getting new business, right from lead generation to navigating the sale to closing, including that would be pricing. And then personnel is the strengths and weaknesses of those involved in business development and then how how the functions are assigned, et cetera. And so this firm and a lot of firms that I've seen really was succeeding based on the strength of one or two people. Right, and, and one then, of them had just left, too. <laughs> yeah, one of them had just left, so that kind of began the de, you know somewhat of a decline of the firm, which in, coincidentally you know, coincided with me joining the firm, so I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure how much of a contribution I had to the decline. <laughs> it eventually was turned around, and the firm was sold in a successful sale. Um, but... So we were suffering from a lack of positioning, a lack of fundamental business strategy for the firm. So when it came to run an ad about why somebody should hire us or kind of the brand or the message that we wanted to put forward, we had five different people who could not agree on what we wanted to say about the firm. And it just, it was so obvious to me in a moment of frustration, I realized, you know, very few ad agencies ever advertise. <clears throat> um, I can think of one who used to do it repeatedly, was very good at it, and they won all the awards. They really took a chance, and we can talk about them maybe in a minute. But I realized it, the frustration that we were having internally, or I was having internally with my colleagues, that the, ob- the reason why ad agencies don't advertise is obvious. They don't know what to say. But in the, you know, the question was not like, why don't, advertising agencies buy ads in this case you had a free ad and you didn't know what to yeah. do with it yeah so what so what so what back to this article then so you wrote the article because you saw how the firm was struggling thinking through this what did you do with the article oh well i i wrote it up and i had, had had been acquiring a list of prospective clients and i sent it out to everybody on the list the way that thought leadership was sent in 1998 facts <laughs> I faxed it out to people. By the time I got to about my third article, I was sending it by, via fax and email. Yeah. And then probably within 18 months, it was all email. But that was the beginning of a content marketing for me. And it was by, via fax machine. Heady times. Yeah. <laughs> There, there's still some companies that require you to use faxes, like medical offices too. And some people don't even know what those are anymore. So so why is it – I mean can we, can we say the same thing about uh, other firms besides ad agencies? Like why don't PR firms do PR for themselves and so on? What is there, – is there a pattern there? Of course, then like why don't, uh, why don't UX firms UX for themselves? I can't – it breaks down at that point, right? But what's, what's, the, what's the basic premise here? Is it primarily that they don't know what to say? But I mean, they don't. But but is this about the message or is it about the medium? Like if they knew what to say, would it make sense for them to use an ad? Well, that's where we get into the B2B versus B2C, right? So if you're if your clients are B2C advertising to uh, consumers, does it make sense for you to run B2B ads? And you could debate that it doesn't but i still think like i think i think there's a core idea here when it comes to lead generation strategy like i used to preach okay do when it comes to generating leads we can call it marketing you do all these different things right and 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 some of them are, are bound to work who knows right and and the more i do this and the older i get the more i see a pattern of the firms that are really successful at lead generation they pick one thing and they basically bet all their chips all, and they put all their lead generation effort on that one thing. So it might be writing a book. It might be a blog. It might be a podcast. It speaking. might be a webcast. Speaking. <clears throat> it might be a conference, esta- establishing a conference. So I, increasingly I'm seeing that there should be one thing that, um, that accounts for 50 to 75% of your lead generation resources, time, money, effort. Uh, thought, etc. And increasingly, I think um, it, it, it at least makes sense to examine when you're trying to determine what that one like marketing channel should be, what that one activity should be. It really makes sense for you to have a hard look at your discipline, the discipline that you're selling. So an ad agency is selling advertising, a public relations firm is selling PR, 
um, video marketing firm is selling video, et cetera. And I think that's the first place that you want to look is the discipline that you are selling and see if you cannot be a best in class example of how to use that channel. So the, one of the best um, ad agencies of all time in Canada was a firm called Palmer, Palmer Jarvis out of um, Vancouver up here in Canada. And then they were bought by DDB and became Palmer Jarvis DDB. And it was, it was essentially a reverse takeover of DDB in Canada by Palmer Jarvis. And they ran, they were the most creative shop in Canada for years. And they ran Palmer Jarvis and then Palmer Jarvis DDB ran the best ads of of for anything that I've ever seen. And they actually ran these ads and paid for them. And more than one time as, you know, firms do so that they can enter award shows. Um, and these ads were highlighting how, and if, maybe if you just Google them, uh, PJ DDB uh, promo ad, mm -hmm. you could probably find, I haven't looked for them in years. It's probably 10 or 15 years, 15 years since they, they were uh, published. But I think those ads drove a lot of business for that firm because they showed that they were good at what they do and that they believed in the medium. Now, conversely, if I go back to 1995, I was working for one of the world's largest ad agencies and I and three friends who also worked in various marketing fields, one was a designer, one worked in an ad agency that I used to work at, one was a photographer, and there was me who was also working in advertising. And we started an online business in 1995 at about the time that Mosaic went public as Netscape. So it was really the beginning of the graphical web. And uh, we were selling clothing with emoticons on it. Um, so we had these pithy sayings like, <laughs> like geeks do it with more RAM and just silly. <laughs> we were the young men embracing the new internet culture and we would just put an emoticon on a baseball hat and sell it for $50 where you would have to download this like JPEG of the order form, print it off and mail it in with a check. And we had a meeting and the business started to take off. And we had a meeting, we talked about advertising and we all agreed, all four of us are in advertising and we all agreed that advertising was a waste of money and we would not spend any money on advertising. But that's what you did for a living. Yeah, that's what I did for a living. So, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't believe in the medium and I was selling it. And I think if you really believe in the medium that you're selling, when it comes to your own lead generation strategy, that medium, that discipline should be at the top of your list. Like PR firms famously say when you ask, and I know you, we've had this conversation before, you ask a principal of a PR firm, how do you go about getting new business? The number one answer, it's almost always what? Referrals probably. Yeah, word of mouth. Word of referrals, mouth, right. word of mouth. Okay, by, by referrals or word of mouth, you mean you don't do anything. What they're trying to communicate is our reputation is so solid, the business just comes to us. If well, we weren't as good, we'd have to work at it, but we're yeah, so yeah, good, yeah. it just comes. Yeah, yeah, but I still need to hire a, a consultant. Right. Um, but that's, uh, so that's, I'm, I'm, be, I'm being a little bit harsh here, but that's, uh, that's the place you want to get to. But the problem with, like, the, these most of these PR firms, in my experience, they're not actively working referrals. They don't, they're not actively working a PR plan. Now, I can think of some examples of PR firms where they've got columns in prestigious newspapers. They are working right. PR, and it is working for them. And that should be these should be great case studies for their own businesses of how to use public relations to succeed. Most firms that specialize in social media do a fantastic job of using social media to promote, uh, promote their firm. So I think that's an example of where firms get it right, uh, social media. PR is an example of, of um, a category where they're saying the right things. I think most of them probably aren't, aren't doing the right things. Advertising is an example of a, a space where um, uh, they're just not doing it. They're just yeah. not doing it. And I've made this uh, statement and this claim publicly in some public forums. Maybe it was something I wrote on LinkedIn. And somebody quite rightly said, well, you're kind of missing the point. You know, advertising is largely a B2C uh, mechanism and, you know, ad agencies are B2B businesses. And right. I think, you know, there's, there is some validity to that, but I know a ton of firms that specialize in B2B. If you're a B2B... And they're not doing it either. Yeah, they're not. If you're a B2B ad agency, you should be looking at running ads. I can't think of any reason why you would not be running paid ads. You're
listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship. Your hosts are David C. Baker of Recourses, author, speaker, and advisor to owners of expert firms, and Blair Enns of Win Without Pitching, the sales training and coaching program for creative entrepreneurs. For more information, go to twobobs.com. If you find this podcast helpful, please help us by telling a friend and rating us on iTunes. Thank you. Now back to David and Blair. So you talked about how the biggest hurdle in your example from your past in the 90s was that they didn't know what to say. Let me throw a few things out here and talk about the relative impact these things have on why they're not doing their marketing for themselves. So not knowing what to say is one for sure, which you've already talked about. The other is that, that they're not disciplined. They're, you know, they're in spite of their best intentions, they're, they're getting sucked into doing client work all the time. There's always something that displaces what should happen. So they're not disciplined. Yeah. Another is that they don't believe in the medium uh, where it maybe this is hard to make a sweeping statement, but is not knowing what to say the primary thing. Like I've noticed that when I I don't do this so much anymore, but I used to look at like the job list, and I wanted to, I always wanted to see. I didn't care about the rest of the jobs that were on the list for the agency. I wanted to know where their marketing fell, like the changes to their own website. Like how long has this project been on the active projects list? And it was always the one that had been on there the longest. It was the oldest one. So that's another way to look at this question. Why is it always the last thing to do? Is it primarily they don't know what to say? Well, I think with creative firms, that's the challenge. And we've, you know, I'm sure we've talked about this before. And it's a theme we, we can't help but keep coming back to it. This, a sign of creativity is an ability to bring a new perspective to an old problem. So your strength as a creative person is to, is to think about something differently. Um, is to solve the problem that you haven't previously solved before. Therefore, you are drawn to new and different problems. Therefore, you resist more than the typical entrepreneur. You resist the idea of focus, even though your business would benefit strongly from focus. So if you've built your business in your own image that way, where you are resisting focus and you don't have a clearly articulated positioning, also known as a fundamental business strategy, then what would you say in an advertise in an ad? I suppose you'd probably say some variation of uh, we're we're more creative than than the next best firm, right? So yeah. you the few ads that you do see, they're um, you know pretty you know there's some pretty good fun funny ads out there that make you kind of smile. But it's pretty rare that you see something as good as the uh, Palmer Jarvis DDB ones that make you go, okay, that is that is one of the most creative ways of clearly communicating a message that I have ever seen. And because these firms don't know what to say in some cases, and it's like not beating them up, it's just true. They just don't, they're not sure what to say. And also because they're frustrated in working with clients regularly, they sort of open this up to, it becomes like a community, communal sort of a project, like, hey, what should we do, team? And it's almost, uh, it's influenced heavily by the fact that now we're free of client constraints. Yeah, These people that are driving us crazy they're not mucking this up now. We can do whatever we want. Plus, let's open this up to all these people and give them a voice. And it means that the work that they are doing, if they ever get around to it, like if they get over that discipline hurdle, it's it's not very focused. It's I don't mean like positioning focus. It just sometimes it's just based on crazy humor as opposed to a message that their prospects really want to hear. It's it, almost it's designed for their peers more than it is for their prospects. Yeah. Well, I th- when I see ad agency advertisements, that's what I think. I think they're targeted to the prospects and I can think back now to some other ad agencies I worked in where it was pretty clear we were thinking about the the our, so we were we were thinking about the competitor not the, the peers, prospect. yeah right yeah and when you know when I think of the president of that firm that I worked for it was like he he, he thought man this is going to be so good you guys are going to love this it was like he had just tossed into the sandbox the coolest toy ever you you guys get to do an ad and it's about us therefore it can be about whatever you want 
So initially he thought, man, this is going to be great. And I think everybody thought it was going to be great. And it just turned into <laughs> this disaster. At some point, somebody sent me an email saying, because I hadn't been at the firm very long and I was the one uh, kind of shooting down or, or like bringing some pragmatism to the exercise and looking at the concepts. And at some point, somebody who came from an impressive firm and had a pretty good CV, he said, would you mind sending me your resume and your portfolio, a portfolio of the work that you've worked on? Yeah. <laughs> so it descended into a little bit of a cat fight pretty quickly. But <laughs> the president, like his intentions were, he thought, man, this is going to be great. Think of the fun we're going to have. But he, what he was really doing was he was demonstrating, you could say he was abdicating his responsibility to position the firm. He had already done that. He had already abdicated his responsibility. And this exercise just kind of manifested. It's so like if we have a firm that builds web properties, builds digital properties, you would think that their website would be so amazing. And I don't mean like all kinds of bells and whistles, but it would mean it would be so clear the the navigation would be so precise and it would have such a finished look. And or if a, if it's an app dev firm that maybe maybe it's an app, right? I've I've only seen a couple of apps total of all the all the agencies I've I've con- come in contact with. So I'm I have this visceral reaction to your idea that like if I'm a video firm, I should I should think about 50 percent of my effort being in there. But I'm but the more I think about it, I th- it's definitely worth thinking about. I don't know where it would go, but it, it's it's an interesting thought. I, um, I I I I wonder. I don't know. I um, uh, let me ask. This is kind of a weird question to ask, but, you know, there's so much emphasis on. Um, marketing automation, sort of like ha- you got to have CRM, you got to have marketing automation, you got to have a great website with all these plugins and everything. But is that true? Do you think that is like at the base of everything? Or is it possible that a firm just has a very basic website with three pages, but maybe they're fairly well known, written a couple of books, speak at the right events? Would that be enough to carry the day or should every firm be thinking about having some great website, great list, same great marketing automation? Where are you on that? I I think the firm on the planet, the creative firm on the planet that does the best marketing and has the best website is the alt design group out of Auckland, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And you go to the and I would, um, you know, we put a lot of uh, like we've invested so much into our website over the years, as I'm sure you have, as I'm sure all the listeners have. And it just as more years go by, there are more things that you're trying to do with your website. There's more technology. The technology is getting cheaper. But, you know, we put all this time and effort into our websites. And for years, I would just like pour a glass of wine in the, and sit down at the kitchen table and open up the website of the alt design group and just stare at it and think, that's what I want. It was inspirational. It's inspirational. It's just a white page and it has been for years. And it says this page intentionally left blank. (laughs) And then there's an email link to an email address or a phone number. That's it. This business was built. The marketing for this business was built on the idea that the most powerful thing in marketing is a rumor. Mm. Right. And um, I've only traded a couple of emails with the with the uh, founders, the principals of this firm. And when I get down to New Zealand, I intend to spend some time with them um, to learn a little bit more. I know somebody who's ex- interviewed them extensively and I've read a little bit about them. I know it's a very successful firm and I know the mythology around this firm is incredible. The stories that circulate, not just in New Zealand, about how much money they're paid and how they win business, they can't all possibly be true. They cannot be true. But I revel in the mythology of it. So mm. the rest of us, we're putting stuff out there. I think I, think I have 120,000 words of free advice on my website. You must have much more. We, we just like put it out there. We're publishing, we're publishing, we're publishing. And we see this. We've got like content numbers we're trying to hit. We've got all these metrics yeah. we're trying to hit. And then here's somebody whose website says this page intentionally left blank. And I can think of at least one other firm where the website hasn't changed in seven or eight years. And it's just, you know, that behind that one page, it's just, again, it's just another page. 
there's a mystery. And the more you think about it, the more your mind fills in the mystery of what's really going on in that firm. But it's an intentional mystery. It's not just laziness or yeah. lack of something to say. Like I have, I have literally told hundreds of my clients, take your website down and put up one or two or three pages with a very clear positioning statement, a way to contact you, and, a, and just some, some statements that really resonate that make you distinct in the marketplace. Because otherwise, you're leaving your crappy website up there for another three years while you figure out what to say. And it's going to be more powerful if you just strip all that stuff away. Now, of course, then yeah, you can go to my website and I'm violating that completely. I, I, I think I've overdone that, honestly. I don't know where I, I'm too close to it. Uh, yeah. But more recently, I've thought, oh, my God, my website looks too much like an encyclopedia. It looks like my version of Wikipedia. And <laughs> it's partly because I like to write and I yeah. think of myself a little kind of like a researcher slash scientist. But I don't if I were to start all over again. And the problem is I don't know how to start all over again. But if I were, I know it wouldn't look like it does with so much stuff up there. And I don't know. How do we get on this? But it's just yeah. – it's interesting though because we're t basically if you're selling content marketing or web marketing then right. you need to be doing content marketing and web marketing but right. you know I have a client whose whose target market is CEOs of Fortune 500 companies they they're not they're not going to his you know like SEO <laughs> is probably not the thing for these people. They read the Harvard Business Review. Right. They read business books. So he's published in Harvard Business Review and he writes business books. Um, and we agree that, you know, the standard kind of guidance that we offer around, um, you know, the, the, the lead gen stuff. Yeah. yeah, all the lead gen stuff. We, I get a lot of that data from Mark O'Brien at Newfangled, as you do. We, agree, we agreed that... Um, that you know, it's just not relevant to his business because his target audience. That's not the best way to to uh, get to his target audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and I'm selling insight, hopefully. So maybe that's why I do some of what I do. But I'm also doing it because I'm comfortable with it, which isn't a very market focused way to do it. I it's uh, it's really interesting. I I was just as I was going ranting on and on about how people ought to just rip their website down and put two or three pages up. I'm thinking. Well, that's easier for you to say, David. You haven't done it yourself, you know, and and I'm not really happy with uh, it's all my fault. It's uh, I, I'm not happy with where where things are right now. I got to figure out what to do with it. Yeah, poet's got a poet, though. You know, you're a writer. You've got to write. And in the field you're in, I'm the same way. I'm a writer. I've got to write. So I'm going to write. And if if that sustains a business, great. If it does, I mean, I at my core, and I think at your, at your core too. We're both writers, so we we need to write like we need to breathe. Yeah. Therefore, it makes sense for us to write. And then we we both have been in the position where we're advising clients who are not writers to write and get on this content marketing game. And that's just I don't think that's been I don't think I've given wise advice on that over the years. I need to recognize more that you know there isn't one pattern that works for every. Right. Every marketing firm, even though the marketing firms might be quite similar. We, and we should be telling our clients, you have to write, but you don't have to publish it. Like you, you, you'll never figure out, you'll never figure out what you, what you believe, what you think, unless you somehow develop the content. It doesn't have to be a traditional article that might be preparing for a webinar, might be thinking through a podcast or whatever it is. You do have to think, you have to get smarter, but you can do it through lots of different ways. And actually, you know, if, if the agency principal is not having fun with it, they're just not going to do it. So it has to have that element too yeah okay we could go deeper into that i think we've done a podcast on that i, I don't know if yeah and yet. i think we've done this podcast too so we beat uh, the crap out of this dead <laughs> horse it's time to end this sucker <laughs> all right <laughs> thank you blair thanks david that was fun thank you for listening to two bobs with david c baker and blair ends subscribe and learn more at twobobs.com that's the number two, B-O-B-S dot com.